Over the last few decades, there have been extraordinary advances in how we can study the brain. And one of some of the most exciting are those that enable us to study the brain in waking, conscious subjects. And I suppose the most exciting for me, as somebody who was in neuroscience for many years, is functional magnetic resonance imaging, in which you can actually indirectly see the neural activity of the brain in waking subjects in all sorts of circumstances. So for many people, this has seemed to give us a window onto the mind. My own position is it tells us an awful lot about the brain, and it's very useful, particularly those who, like me, are concerned about new methods of treating brain disease, but it tells us very little about the nature of the mind, of the interesting things about the human mind. For example, it may tell us a little bit about sensation, possibly about perception, but nothing about wisdom, love, or aesthetic sense, or generally how we shake down with each other in everyday life. One of the dreams is that as a result of using these new techniques or their successors, we will find ways in which the human mind works. Let's have a thought experiment. Let's suppose we had a technique that enabled us to look at every single activity of every single neuron in the brain, and we were able to identify how all the neurons were wired together. And let us suppose also we could follow people, say somebody who was in love, for three months. Would, as a result of this technique, learn, would we learn anything more about love than we learn from poetry, from our daily experience, from music, from philosophy? And I don't think so, because what would be the output of this machine? Lots and lots of zeros and ones, which would hardly illuminate the nature of love. One of the most interesting questions is whether by looking at the brain, we can solve the hard problem of consciousness. Basically, the problem of how it is that it is like to be something. And I don't think we will. When we look at the brain, we look at it as an object. Of course we do. We are objective viewers of the brain. We're looking at the it is of the brain. And in looking at the it is of the brain, it gives us very little insight into the I am of the person, of the subject. And you may say, well, that's okay, it's sort of technical interest, but actually behind it is something much bigger, which is our nature as human beings. My feeling is, I'm a secular humanist, my feeling is that, yes, we've parked up religion, some of us have, but it doesn't mean to say that the alternative religion is a naturalistic account of what we are, that we are essentially identified with ourselves as organisms or the, or the evolved organ that is the human brain. I don't think that's the alternative. I think there's another alternative, which is we are human beings who are neither apes nor angels. And those who are basically want to identify ourselves with our evolved brains, I think secretly imagine that we are somehow apes. And I don't think that is the case. And by the way, we are unique in at least one respect, that is to say we exercise ourselves over our own nature, which I don't think apes do. A lot of people said, well, okay, in separating the brain from the mind or distinguishing the brain from the mind, you suggest that we are something elusive, spiritual, not to be understood, as it were, as part of the world. Well, my, my way of separating the brain from the mind is not in a Cartesian sense of seeing us as kind of ghosts in the brain machine. I think we are certainly conscious beings and courtesy of our brains, we are conscious. Basically, you get rid of my brain and you get rid of my consciousness. Chop my head off, my IQ falls, and so on and so forth. But uh, that doesn't mean to say that I believe, as it were, there are two substances. One is mental, the mind, and the other is physical, the brain. I don't think we've even got the beginning of understanding where our consciousness fits in to the larger universe, the universe of which we are conscious, the universe which we've actually called the universe, the universe we put in inverted commas. We haven't even begun. And I don't think we'll begin until we park up a whole pile of bankrupt theories. One is materialism, the idea that the mind is essentially the pro a property of the brain or identical with neural activity. The other is dualism, the notion that there's a ghost of the mind in the machine of the brain. The third is panpsychism, the idea that mind must be everywhere, otherwise we couldn't have it in the brain. I think all of those are utterly bankrupt theories. I am an ontological agnostic. I do not know how we relate mind and body, and indeed how many fundamental kinds of things there are. But until we recognize we haven't the faintest idea at the moment, we won't even begin. And I'm totally one with Jerry Fodor, the great psychologist, who said that we, 
we'll make no progress in understanding the relationship between mind and brain until we set aside many, many assumptions, concepts and cherished ideas. And I think that's what we need to do, and then we can really start. At the moment, we're not even at the beginning. Do we have any theories about consciousness? We have lots and lots of daft theories, and I could bore you stiff by reciting some of the bonkers theories there are. I don't think we need to, we are, need to have a theory of consciousness, nor are we are likely to arrive at, because after all, a theory is a late product of consciousness. And to have a theory of consciousness that explains consciousness is like the roof of the house somehow explaining the foundations. And I don't think that is possible. We can do many other useful and interesting things uh, quite separate from having a theory of consciousness. And within neuroscience, neuroscience has potentially great use in helping us to address, uh, particularly in my case of interest, uh, address uh, brain, brain disease and so on and so forth. But the idea of having a theory of consciousness would be more than a theory of everything. It would be a theory of that which is able to produce theories of everything, or claims to. Uh, I, I have been to the festival years ago in the early days uh, when it was just starting, including the winter festivals as well. And I've always been impressed by the sheer quality of the dialogue, the discussion. Unlike many literary festivals, and this is not a literary festival, it's festival ideas, it isn't sort of celebrity based. It's based really on ideas, really on discussion. And uh, I have to say it's uh, a feast for the mind. And as the things I've enjoyed today, I had to absolutely drag myself out reluctantly on the debate on the Big Bang and the creation of the universe. I had to go out because I had to give my own gig. To be honest, I would have preferred uh, to have stayed and listened to what Sean Carroll and uh, Roger Penrose and uh, the, the people had had to say. It was an extraordinarily wonderful discussion. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.